Good day. Hi, my name is Dr. Howard Rosenthal, and you, my friend, are going to write a book. When I lecture to audiences, the first question I ask is, how many of you would like to write a book that will appear on the New York Times bestseller list? Then I thoroughly disappoint the audience by telling them that I would like to write one myself but I don't have a clue how to go about it. You need a lot of talent, a lot of luck, some fabulous marketing, and it helps to be in the right place at the right time. I do, however, know a tad about writing books, including the fact that I have penned two publishers' bestsellers. It's not the same as being on the New York Times bestseller list, but it's not too shabby either. Not counting revisions, I now have seven books in print, one in press, a contract on another, a number of audio programs, including one that is the leader in the field, and a videotape. So, yes, I do know a tad about what it takes to get published. Just so you'll have supreme confidence in my methods, you should know that I have written a number of pieces in magazines, newspapers, on the web, and in professional journals. Today, I conducted a search on Amazon.com using the word counseling, and three of my books were in the top seven slots. A BNN.com search revealed that one of my titles held the number two spot. Finally, when top literary agent Jeff Herman wrote, you can make it big writing books. A top agent shows you how to create a million dollar bestseller, a book I must add that you definitely must read. He chose to interview me as one of the 60 top authors, along with folks like Mark Victor Hansen of Chicken Soup for the Soul fame and Barry Sears, who wrote the Zone Diet books. Incidentally, when I autograph copies of the book, I write, from the only author in the book who doesn't know how to make a million dollars writing books yet. Over the years, I've amassed a number of key strategies and insider secrets to help people get published. And in this exciting audio program, I'm going to share them with you. It seems there are only two ways to achieve immortality. You can live on a diet limit it to broccoli and kale, or you can write a book. I've chosen the latter. It's a heck of a lot easy. There's an old saying that the best book is probably sitting in somebody's file cabinet at home, and that's because most people know as much about getting their manuscript published as monkeys know about nuclear physics. But for you, that's about to change. Before we get started, there is something I must share with you. You see, without this key piece of information, you are doomed to failure. Yes, I said doomed to failure. Here it is. Famous people, such as Dr. Such and Such on primetime talk shows or radio shows, will not necessarily follow the strategies I will be recommending when they write a book. The cold, hard truth, however, is that if you wrote the identical book, I mean word for word, verbatim, as that expert, you couldn't give it away to a publisher. Thus, as I begin to cast these gems of wisdom at you, you may find yourself saying, well, such and such didn't do that. And guess what? You are right. Famous people do not have to follow the roadmap. You, on the other hand, most decidedly will. Let's begin with a very simple question. What will you write a book about? Most folks respond with something like, Oh, say, I'll write a general counseling, psychology, human services, self-help, or psychotherapy book. That will be really interesting. Out of all the topics in the field you could possibly write about in the entire world, the general counseling, psychology, self-help, psychotherapy, or human service book 
is the type of book that is by far the least likely to get you published. This strategy will most likely fail miserably. Forget it. The first thing that a publisher looks for is an idea that is new, fresh, or different. Something new with a twist. Is your idea for a book novel? <laughs> Don't be so sure. I was recently working with a brilliant therapist who thought she had the idea for a new book about counseling and psychotherapy. I too was excited. The idea sounded great. It sounded innovative. Excited, that is, until we punched the idea up on one of the major internet bookstores and found 284, let me say that again, 284 similar books. End of project. Case closed. Before you spend one minute writing your new book, no, stop. Make that one minute even thinking about it. Research the territory to see what is out there. Get on the internet, and if you can't sleep, hit the all-night bookstores. Most people who think they have the idea of the century. Discover that the idea has been done a thousand times before. When you are writing a counseling or behavioral science book, it is absolutely imperative that you look for an opening in the market, something that doesn't exist or something that hasn't existed in years. Look for a niche market, great example. I discovered that there were dictionaries of psychology, psychiatry, and social work, but not one for human services. So, I did what any self-respecting writer would have done. I wrote one myself. Now, this next small tip is worth considerably more than the price you paid for this program, so open up your ears. In today's market, in general, the more specific the topic, the reader, or the market, the better. Please indulge me while I explain. Most counselors try to write a book that appeals to everybody in the field. As I said before, a general book. Big mistake, folks. To make this simple, let's take an example outside of our field so you can be objective. If you decided to write a general book about automobiles, it would probably be a loser. A book about Chevys is probably a little better in today's market. A book about 57 Chevy Bel Airs is most likely even better, while in all probability, a book about 57 fuel-injected Bel Air Chevy convertibles is most likely the best. This is very important, so let's take an example from our field. A general book about counseling would be pretty hard to get published. A book about rational emotive behavior therapy, aka REBT, a tad easier to sell. A book about counseling teens using rational emotive behavior therapy would be even better. And a book about using REBT to counsel disabled teens that are pregnant would probably be your best bet. Of course, you are cutting down on the market. However, you are a lot more likely to dominate the specific market. Sure, it's possible to make your market too small, but 99% of the counselors I've worked with who have book ideas, they are just too broad. Try to be specific. The next critical step is to ask yourself, how will I publish my book? Basically, there are three ways to see a paper and ink book in print. One, self-publish the work. Two, use a subsidy publisher. And three, use what I call the real thing. Let's begin with self-publishing. Now, self-publishing can be as simple as using a copy machine to produce your work are taking it to a fast print shop. Nevertheless, when most authors talk about self-publishing, they are referring to the fact that numerous companies 
will print small runs of your book for very small sums of money. For example, here's an ad I'm looking at at the back of a magazine called The Writer. Good magazine. The company will publish a 96-page book with 5.5 by 8.5 inch pages for $1.65 a piece if you buy a thousand copies. Now let's look at another example. Here's a company advertising in Writer's Digest, another good magazine, that suggests that they will publish a hundred copies of your book for just 384 smackers. Add a buck a book if you'd like a cool color cover. Most companies of this ilk will tell you that a lot of famous books were originally self-published. My take on this is that you could also win the lottery or have a garbage can fall on your head while conducting a therapy session. I do recommend self-publishing, but only for a select few. Only a small number of people. Number one. If you were one of the top direct marketing experts in the nation, self-publish. That leaves out nearly every single person who will ever listen to this program. Translation, self-publishing probably isn't for you. Number two, if you give tons of seminars where you present to thousands and thousands of people a year, self-publishing might, notice I said might, be the way to go. And number three, if everything else I teach you in this program fails, then hey, you can always self-publish. The problem with self-publishing is that you must do your own marketing. Thus, after you give a copy to the reality therapist down the hall, the middle school counselor who made a referral to you last year, the guy at the fast oil change who is contemplating taking an introductory psychology course, and of course your mother, how will you sell the other 996 copies that are collecting cobwebs in your basement? Tough question, isn't it? You could take a full page ad in American Counseling Association's Counseling Today newspaper but where would you get the $2,040 or so for the ad? You could take out an ad in the American Psychological Association's monitor, but here again, do you mind spending $6,260 per ad? A real book publisher might send out 100,000 or 300,000 catalogs at a crack. Let's see just the price of a hundred thousand stamps to send out a single flyer on your book would set you back about thirty seven thousand dollars ouch now although self-publishing is not the greatest option in the world it still commands more status than vanity or subsidy publishing subsidy publishers will produce beautiful books in fact in many instances the book looks every bit as good as the best looking tomes you see when you visit your local bookstore what is not emphasized is that subsidy publishing companies often charge a king's ransom to publish your book a friend of mine revealed that she took a loan that rivaled her used car loan a tad over ten grand to pay for her subsidy book. When I shared this story at a recent workshop I conducted on book publishing, a participant took offense. Why? I thought perhaps the figure I quoted was too high. Wrong. The participant suggested that she paid considerably more, in fact nearly double the amount I quoted, for her subsidy published book. Most consumer watchdog organizations warn against vanity publishing. Many bookstores refuse to carry subsidy titles, and most vanity companies promise a great deal more marketing than you will generally ever see. The difference between a vanity published book, or for that matter a self-published work, when compared to the real thing, is that the real legitimate publisher you don't pay to have your book published. In fact, they pay you in the form of royalties. 
For 98% of the folks listening, this, my dear listener, is the way to go. When you walk into a bookstore, a university bookstore, or a library, nearly every book you see on the shelves is produced by a publisher who is paying the author based on copies sold. That's why I call it the real thing. Again, this is the way to go for most of us. Now, why would anybody not take this route? <laughs> the answer is easy. It's very, 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 that's five varies, tough to get a book published. In fact, let me tell you something right from the get-go. You must believe in yourself and your writing because in this rough and tumble business, rejection is commonplace. You must, yes must, resign yourself to the fact that you will be rejected at times. Do I get rejected when I send book manuscripts in from time to time? Hello, do birds fly? Mark Victor Hansen, co-author of the Dynamite Record Smashing Chicken Soup for the Soul series, says that he was rejected by nearly every publishing house in New York. Ditto for Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. An author must believe in his or her product even after it's accepted for publication. Dr. Wayne Dyer penned a self-improvement or so-called pop psychology text called Your Erroneous Zones. He was told that the book would never sell over 1,500 copies. For 10 years in a row, the book outsold every other title and distinguished itself as the best-selling book of the 1970s. That's right, the best-selling book of the decade. Stories of authors being rejected 40 or 50 times are not unusual. I have a friend who created the definitive work in his field, only to be rejected by over 750 publishers and agents over a 20-year period. Today, his book is in print, and he's hitting the radio show, talk shows and lecture circuit as we speak. Let me give it to you straight without the sugar coating. There are no guarantees in the book publishing field. It is possible that you could do everything, I mean everything I recommend in this program, and still get rejected. Sorry, but that's the cold, hard, undiluted truth. Anybody who tells you otherwise just has his eye on your wallet, purse, bank account, or credit card. Also, the sad truth is that your first book is generally the most difficult to get published. When I emphasize just how common rejection is, lots of counselors say, okay, Rosenthal, hey, look, I don't want to deal with that. How do I secure an agent? Well, hold on to your horses there, because before you run out and try to snare an agent, you better listen to what I have to say, because for many, if not most counselors listening to this, you don't want an agent. Your best bet for coping with a system is to do exactly what I tell you in this program. Several years ago, I published a book, and it began to sell rather well. I thus hit the same publisher with another project. I would have bet my kids' video game collections that they would have accepted the new project. Good thing I didn't. They rejected it just weeks later with a single paragraph rejection letter. My licensing preparation book, The Encyclopedia of Counseling, is a tremendously successful book. The publisher has even deemed it a publisher's bestseller. For well over 10 years, a day rarely goes by when somebody doesn't contact me to say thanks for creating the text. Just for the record, the first publisher I sent it to rejected the idea almost immediately. Imagine what would have occurred if I would have threw in the proverbial towel after that single rejection letter. But forget about rejection now. We're going to be optimistic. Let's talk about how to find a publisher. 
My biggest secret for finding an appropriate publisher is what I call my psychology of the pinball machine strategy. Now, for those of you who are old enough to remember, there are basically two ways to beat these two armed bandits. The first way is very tough. The machine sets a numerical figure, say 100,000 points, and you must use your skill to score 100,000 or more points to win. But there's another way to win that's a lot easier. This strategy is called matching. To win a free game via matching, the final number in your score simply matches a random number picked by the machine. Say the machine number is 9 then you could have a terrible, pathetic score of 99 and win, where a very high score like 99,500 would be a loser. Matching, let's just say it's an easy way to win. Now, in the publishing business, the key factor is to find a publisher that publishes the type of book you have created. In other words, it is absolutely, positively crucial to match your publisher to your book. It sounds so ridiculously simple, yet I rarely, if ever, meet a new author that takes this into consideration. This is a key issue because publishers are very specific about what they will or will not publish. Let me give you a stellar example. An agency therapist with over 30 years clinical experience contacted me because, as he put it, I've tried everything and publishers keep sending me rejection letters. The therapist was attempting to find a publisher for his self-help book for adult children of alcoholics, and he assured me he had taken the principle of matching, that is to say, finding an appropriate publisher into consideration. In fact, he said to me, and I quote, of course I've taken matching into account. I've only been sending the manuscript to psychology publishers. Now, I know that on the surface that sounds great, but let's take a little closer look. In fact, let's take a much closer look and put these publishers under an electron microscope, again, something that most neophyte authors never do, to find out why, instead of snaring a book contract, this therapist's new part-time hobby was collecting publishers' rejection letters. The first rejection letter he showed me was from a psychology publisher, but the publisher's forte was publishing college textbooks. Any chance they would buy his self-help book, written for adult children of alcoholics? Virtually none. Sorry, Charlie, no chance. I'd have a better chance of winning the lottery today, and I haven't even purchased a ticket. The next rejection letter was from a publisher who did market self-help and self-improvement literature. Nevertheless, they only market materials with a spiritual slant. The word spirituality did not appear in the therapist's book manuscript. Still, another rejection letter he shared with me was from a psychology publisher who he told me he was sure would take the book. Sure, that is, until I explained to him that this publisher wanted materials related to grief counseling. Here again, his book didn't even include a chapter on grief. Do you see how easy it is to delude yourself into thinking that you sent your materials to the perfect publisher when you did not? Here's the point. Even if this therapist had written the best book on this subject in the history of the planet, he would have no chance, zip, zero of ever seeing it in print by approaching these publishers. The same goes for approaching an agent. Imagine approaching an agent who only attempts to sell poetry, and you send her information on your new book about the history of the psychoanalytic movement. Sorry, but it's not going to work, folks. So, just how do you find a publisher or an agent? 
Many authors turn to a huge book that you can buy at almost any bookstore or through the internet called The Writer's Market or another book called The Writer's Market Online, which is really the same thing. Another good resource is called Literary Marketplace, or LMP for short. Other authors use top agent Jeff Herman's book, A Guide to Book Editors, Publishers, and Literary Agents. I really like Jeff Herman's book, and as you will recall, I mentioned Jeff Herman earlier in this program. These books will help clarify what the publisher or the agent is actually looking for. You will also find contact information such as the editor or agent's name and address. A really neat trick is to surf the net or go to a local bookstore or university bookstore and look for books that are very similar to yours. For example, I was working with a counselor who had written a psychological testing textbook intended for school counselors, school psychologists, and school psychometricians. We went to every college and university bookstore and looked at all the books for courses like individual inventory, individual intelligence testing, to see precisely which publishers were interested in this type of book. Another insider's secret is to read the acknowledgments section of the books that are similar to yours. Why? <laughs> I was hoping you would ask. The answer is easy. Often the author will thank his or her agent and book editor. Now you know that an agent or editor is interested in books of this ilk. Publishers catalogs are a gold mine since they depict precisely what the company is selling. You can call the publisher up and order one. In many cases, the publishers now have their catalogs on the web. The catalog or online catalog will give you a description of all the books they carry, and thus it gives you a first-class course in what they like to print. As a bonus, the catalog will often reveal forthcoming titles. So maybe you've got this great idea for a book, but hey, somebody already hit the publisher with it. Now, I've got a question for you. Are you a counselor educator? Do you teach human services or social work? Are you an adjunct professor who teaches psychology? Well, I've got a secret to share, so close the door and listen. You know those book reps, the guys and gals who come out and try to sell you on using the latest, newest textbook for your class? Well, guess what? They can be your best ally when you've got an idea for writing a book. In some cases, these book reps get a bonus if they sign you up to write a book for their company. And... They score points with their supervisors at the publishing house. So, let me shout this out. If you are writing a book, make it a point to interrupt your friendly book rep sales pitch just long enough to tell him or her that you are writing an exciting new book. Just for the record, nothing is universal in the universe, including my aforementioned tips. Sure, they are excellent, but even my suggestions don't work in every situation. A publisher once sent me a rejection letter stating that my idea for a new book was very similar to a book they already had. It happened to be one of their top sellers. He confided that he thought mine might actually be a tad better and thus might take sales away from the existing text. Oh well, you can't win them all. Now, I want to tell you about something I like to call my tuxedo on the beach theory of book publishing. Let's say you were on a sunny beach and the temperature was hovering just above the 100 degree mark. A fellow who was not getting married is lying in the scorching sun on a beach towel dressed in a tuxedo. You'd most likely think to yourself, gee, 
This guy really doesn't know much about beach attire, and he sure doesn't know how to dress for the beach. Now, let's relate this to the publishing business. Every day of the year, hundreds, if not thousands, of aspiring authors go to their mailbox to ship a book manuscript to a publisher or agent. Dumb, 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 and dumber. Why is it dumb? Tuxedo on the beach theory. When the agent or editor sees the manuscript, he knows that the author, like the guy on the beach in a tuxedo, has no clue what he or she is doing. Incidentally, the penalty for not knowing what you are doing is that the agent or editor sends you what a lot of writers like to refer to as a Dear John letter. It says something like, Dear Dr. Rosenthal, I am very sorry we can't use your new book on, reality, on the new reality therapy. It looks extremely interesting and we hope to see it on the shelves one day soon. Now let me share with you the real world translation of what the letter means. We have absolutely no interest whatsoever in your book on the new reality therapy. Don't bother us again regarding this manuscript. I am going to teach you how to approach an agent or an editor so that he or she will know that you know what you are doing. Hence, at least you'll have a fighting chance of seeing your book in print. Rule number one, unless an agent or editor tells you differently, which will almost never happen, never, ever, ever, ever send a manuscript. No sir and no ma'am. Here is what you will send every editor and agent. 1. A query letter. 2. A book proposal. 3. A chapter or two from your new book. And 4. A bio, vita, or resume. Let's begin with the query letter, also called a cover letter or covering letter. This is a short letter that expert authors send out when attempting to get a book published. If the editor or agent reads the letter and doesn't like it, then you'll get a Dear John rejection letter. But if the person likes it, then you might just get a contract. Here are the rules for writing your letter. First, write the letter on white or off-white paper. White is preferable. Keep the letter short. Two pages is too long. A page and a half is better, but one page is best. Since this is a business letter, single space the letter. Do not double space the letter. Use 12 point font and use a font that is easy to read, such as Times New Roman or Courier. Never use bold or italics for the entire letter or the agent or editor will know you don't know how to write a business letter. Put your contact information such as name, address, phone number, and email address at the top. If you have real stationery, use it. A letter from Harvard, Georgetown, or the university whatever helps you score brownie points. Agency or hospital stationery can be equally impressive. Do not stupidly write something at the top like Dr. Howard Rosenthal non-fiction counseling and psychotherapy author. It makes you look like an amateur. And yes, I'm bringing this up because counselors sometimes engage in this pernicious practice. Since this is a business letter, remember to put a colon after the editor or agent's name. Begin with an opening sentence that proves you have something fascinating to say. For example, Dear Mrs. Jones, a new body of little-known research indicates that narrative therapy is the best choice for teens diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. Unfortunately, this intriguing research is virtually unknown in the U.S. The idea is to come up with something catchy. The letter is a sample of your writing, thus you must prove to the agent or editor that you can not only describe your book, but that the book will hold the reader's interest. Simply put, 
the letter must attest to the fact that you know how to write. Keep the first paragraph short. In fact, keep all the paragraphs in your query letter short. Research indicates that short paragraphs make a document look easier to read. Next, immediately swing into the second paragraph. In this paragraph, I want you to be very specific about your book. So you might say, this book would be the ideal text for students in a first year counselor education program taking a course in the theories of counseling. Or how about this? My new book, Counseling Disabled African American Senior Citizens, includes a bevy of psychotherapeutic techniques conspicuously missing from other works of this nature. In this letter, you want to inform the editor or agent of the name of the book you are writing, approximately how long the book will be. Again, what is unique or different about your book? Who is your audience? Is it first-year undergraduate human services students? Is it private practitioners? Is it graduate social work students serving a practicum? Perhaps it is peer counselors working in an inpatient substance abuse or addiction treatment center. Finally, why you? Yes, why you? Why should you be the one to write this book? What makes you so qualified? Now, here's some great news. Most people listening to this program have a huge advantage over Mr. and Mrs. Joe Average who decides to write a book. Here's why. Let's say that your neighbor Sam decides he wants to write a golf book. And let's say he's an accountant during the day. He's not a professional golfer. He's not a teaching professional. He's never served as a caddy for Tiger Woods. And he's never even seen the inside of a golf school. Or take your other neighbor, Sally, who works as a teller at the local bank. She has an idea for a cookbook. Unfortunately, she isn't a cook in a restaurant. She's never been Oprah's personal chef. Heck, she's never even won the St. Louis chili cook-off. However, nearly everybody listening to this program has an advanced degree, such as a Ph.D., Psy.D., M.A., M.S.W., M.E.D., or E.D.D., related to the subject that he or she will be writing about. Man, oh man, is that a plus. Maybe you also have a license such as LPC, LMFT, LCSW, or licensed psychologist. Perhaps you are certified by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education as a school counselor or psychometrician. This is no time to be modest. If you have taught group practice and human services for 29 years, say so. If you've been the director of the stress unit for a large hospital, tell the editor or agent in your query letter. If you trained with Albert Ellis or Milton H. Erickson, say so. Now, a lot of folks will be mega disappointed about what I'm going to say next. But you know what? You paid your hard-earned money, and you want me to tell you the cold, hard truth. You want me to be honest and shoot from the hip. So here goes. Let me lay this on you. A very high percentage of people listening to this program should not be writing a cover letter to an agent or editor yet. In fact, they have no business writing a book yet. Instead, they should be trying to snare some writer's credentials. How do you go about this? Simple. You write something that is smaller and generally easier to publish than a book. Perhaps you could write a small article for the college newspaper where you teach. Maybe you could write a marriage counseling column for the free throwaway paper in your neighborhood. A small magazine article or two would also help, as would a professional journal article. You could even write a guest editorial for the American Counseling Association's Counseling Today. Internet articles are another realistic possibility. 
If you have some writing experience under your belt, it can and will help you become a published book author. If you have already published something, the editor or agent often takes you much more seriously. The articles you have written need not be on counseling, psychology, psychiatry, psychotherapy, social work, or human services, but in my opinion, most articles of this ilk will help you the most. Nevertheless, if you haven't written an article in the behavioral science field, that old Roosevelt to Roosevelt history article of yours is still better than no writing credentials at all. Needless to say, publishing credentials are no guarantee, even if you have published 10 books, there's no guarantee that an agent or editor will accept your current project. But again, publishing credentials generally truly help. Small writing jobs are often easy to secure. I once drove by the offices of a brand spanking new newspaper. They were just getting ready to open their doors and print their first issue. I walked in and convinced the owner in less than three minutes that I could write a great counseling column for him, and he said yes right on the spot. Okay, back to the query letter. You must delineate your education other than writing, okay? If you have a PhD in marriage and family counseling, say so. Again, if you trained with Eric Byrne or Jay Haley, don't be modest. Put it down on paper. Volunteer information that makes you uniquely qualified to write this book. A couple of final hints for your query letter. Never say that you have been rejected before in your query letter. That's dumb, 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 and well, you know what I'm going to say. Also, don't make unrealistic promises about your book. For example, this textbook will outsell every other book ever written on counseling depressed children. Yeah, sure. Or, my behavior modification for classroom teachers book should have no trouble landing me a spot on the New York Times bestseller list. Boasting like this merely ensures that the editor or agent will view you as an idiot or perhaps an individual who is in dire need of therapy. Hint, not a desirable thing. Another super idea is to mention in your query letter that this is a multiple submission. Multiple submission means that you are sending your submission package to several agents and our book publishers, maybe even a whole bunch of them, concurrently. In other words, you are sending them out at the same time. Why would this help you? The answer is easy. If an agent or editor is wavering, you know, not sure whether he or she should take action on your idea, you have just informed him or her that a lot of other folks in the publishing business are also looking at your idea. And if he or she procrastinates, another company or agent might just get your book first. All right, moving right along. In addition to your query letter, you are always going to include a book proposal. On rare occasions, authors have told me that they have actually spent more time on the book proposal than writing the entire book. Why? Well, the only way most agents or editors will read your book manuscript is if they like your query letter. In essence, the query letter is an advertisement to get the folks in the publishing business to read your book proposal. And your book proposal becomes an advertisement to read your manuscript. Play that back again. It's extremely important. Now, here's great news. In recent years, some publishers have been putting guidelines for creating a book proposal, or what is sometimes referred to as a book prospectus, right on their websites. To be sure, this makes life a lot easier, and it takes some of the guesswork out of writing this all-important document. But what should you do if the publisher does not give you guidelines, or the guidelines are a bit vague? 
since I don't want to leave anything to chance, I'm going to tell you precisely, I mean exactly, how I want you to write your book proposal. So, just how long is a good book proposal? Well, it varies widely depending on the nature of the book, but I'd say four to eight pages is the norm for academic publishers. Always double space this document and never ever send an old beat up dog-eared copy that has been read a hundred times. Always send an editor or an agent a good clean copy. Never fold the document. Thus, your query letter and proposal must be placed in a mailing envelope that is large enough that you will not need to fold the pages. First, you will create a title page. I recommend that you center everything on this page. Begin with your title and your subtitle. For example, Condition Reflex Therapy, History, Theory, and Practice or take this actual example from my own personal publishing trophy closet, Encyclopedia of Counseling, and then the subtitle, Master Review and Tutorial for the National Counselor Examination and State Counseling Exams. Under the title and the subtitle, I want you to write the words, A Complete Book Proposal. Next, I want you to put contact information, such as your name, with degrees and certifications. Don't be modest, you earned them. Then put your address, phone number, and email. And that's it. You're done with the title page. You live through it. One optional thing you can do is to place a cool picture or photograph on the title page to entice the reader to read on. Now, I've never really done this myself, but if you are artistically inclined or you're an expert photographer, this might just give your proposal an extra shot of adrenaline. If you are writing a textbook or an academic work, this probably isn't the strategy for you. Nevertheless, if you are writing pop psych for the general public, then the picture photograph idea might be relevant. I also want to mention that even if your picture or photo is very good, it most likely won't make it onto the cover of the actual work. Here are the exact headings you can use for your proposal, and make sure you bold all of your headings. The first heading is the working title. Again, simply write the title, and if the book has a subtitle, simply tell what it is. Number two, here is your second heading, Idea in Brief. Under this heading, simply give a short synopsis of the book. Number three, third heading, you will call it Premise. Under this heading, give a rationale for the book. Why are you writing it? For example, most other Gestalt therapy books are geared toward working with the general population. However, this innovative book will focus on using Gestalt therapy with families where one or more family members has Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. This is important because in the U.S. alone, it is estimated that 500,000 people are diagnosed with ADHD. A few paragraphs or a few pages at the very most should suffice under this heading. Sorry, but nobody on the face of the earth can tell you precisely how long your descriptions under each heading will be. It varies depending on the work in question. It's actually a judgment call on a book-by-book -book basis. Some authors merely combine the second and third headings calling this section of the proposal, idea in brief and premise, or perhaps just calling it rationale for writing this book. Time for our fourth heading, author's background and promotional skills. Again, under this heading, answer the key question, why are you qualified to write this baby? Also, 
put something about your promotional skills if you have any. For example, you're dating Oprah Winfrey and can get the book on her show. Fat chance. How about you give over 50 seminars a year on Gestalt therapy? Yeah, that's probably a tad more realistic. Fifth heading, table of contents. Just write out the table of contents. It's that simple. Number six, chapter outline. Here you will give the title of each chapter and what it will cover. A few sentences per chapter will often suffice. Heading number seven, tone. That's right, tone, T-O-N-E. Is the book serious? Is it humorous because you are writing a bibliotherapy book for middle school boys who can't seem to get along with their parents? Is it sarcastic? Is it folksy? Is your book tailored to therapists who read professional referee journals and thus it is written like a psychology, counseling, social work, or human services journal article? Eighth heading, market considerations. Under this heading, it is imperative that you will explain precisely who will buy the book. Will it be graduate students enrolled in a human growth and development class? Will it be counselors who wish to start their own private practice? Will it be private practice counselors who wish to segue into a managed care or managed care-free practice? Is it intended for clinicians who work with single parents and have suicidal children? Try to be specific here. Also, if you can figure it out, how big is your market? How many people are there out there that might read this book or might have the difficulty you are writing about? Number nine, your ninth heading, Competitive Works. Beneath this heading, you should list other books that are similar to yours, providing titles, authors, publishers, and publication dates, and then go on to explicate how your book is different. Remember not to trash these other books. Simply say things like this is the first book on pet grief that deals with gerbils. The bottom line, what makes your book better? I've already discussed ways you can find similar works. However, another great source that your local librarian can hook you up with is a book titled Books in Print. Okay, your tenth and final heading, length. That's right, length. Many word processing programs have a feature that will tell you how many words have been keyboarded into the document. You could also count the number of words on a typical page and multiply this figure by the total number of pages to come up with a fairly accurate estimate. Some authors merely say something like, the manuscript has 256 double-spaced pages. Keep in mind that some publishers have an upper limit. For example, I have a document in front of me from a major social science publisher indicating that their company will not accept a manuscript that exceeds 350 typed pages. Insider hint. Publishers often figure the length of the actual book by using the one-third rule. The one-third rule suggests that the actual book is about one-third less than the type version you will send them. Thus, your 300-page manuscript will be roughly a 200-page book when it is typeset. You also want to include a chapter or two in your packet. Many authors include the first chapter of the book and then the chapter that they feel is the best or the strongest chapter in the book. Okay, you've created a complete book proposal or prospectus. Congratulations. But how do you know if you've done an acceptable job? Well, quite frankly, many, if not most authors, don't have a clue. Therefore, I'm going to pull out all the stops and share my 11 key strategies for creating a wildly successful book proposal. 
Okay, are you ready? I assure you this is great stuff. Here goes. Number one, make sure you explain the purpose or main theme of the book. What is your book about? How will it help clients, students, or practitioners in the field? What are your goals in writing the book? Discuss the importance of your findings or contributions. Number two, who is your target audience? Simply put, who is going to buy this book? Who will read it? Be as specific as you possibly can. What level is the book written on? A self-help book for 8th grade girls whose parents are divorced will differ from a research book intended for advanced PhD, EDD, DSW, and PsyD students. Is this the type of book that the publisher can market via mailing lists, for example, to members of the American Counseling Association, the Association for Specialists in Group Work, or the National Organization of Human Services? If so, name all the groups that might apply. Is there a market for your book overseas or in other countries? 3. Is the book suitable as a textbook in a classroom? If so, are we talking about graduate or undergraduate classes? Give course titles whenever possible. Is the book going to be the main text for the class or could it be used as a supplement? Number four, what separates and distinguishes your book from the competition? Again, what makes it better? If possible, compare it to the top three competitors. Did you provide the name, publication date, author, and publisher of the competitive works and devote a short paragraph to each? Perhaps you've heard of the great marketing genius, Rosa Reeves, who created the concept of the USP, our unique selling proposition. Reeves noted that all products and businesses should have a USP. It would be a cardinal sin to leave out a USP in a book proposal. And if you don't have a unique selling proposition, well, I'm sorry to be mean, but you have no business writing a book. What are the unique features and benefits of your book? I am so enamored with this idea that I often include a special heading titled Unique Selling Proposition in my own proposals are, say the book is titled Person-Centered Therapy with Delinquent Teens. Why not create a proposal heading like, Why Person-Centered Therapy with Delinquent Teens is Different than the Competition? Number five, what is the current status of your project? Is the proposal packet all you have written? Will the project be done next December? Do you have just 20 pages to complete? Or is the manuscript finished, ready to rock and roll if a publisher or agent says yes to your idea? Could the book manuscript be shipped out tomorrow? Number six, will the book contain pictures, photos, materials printed elsewhere, or graphs? If so, roughly how many? Artwork and design features can often influence production costs. Will the book have references and footnotes? Number seven, did you actually describe your credentials and qualifications? Did you enclose a curriculum vita or CV? If you have co-authors or contributors, did you describe their qualifications and affiliations? Did you remember to put the co-authors' names on the title page of the proposal? Number eight, will the book have an index? Hint, in some cases, the publisher will agree to create the index for you. However, the publisher may indeed charge you a reasonable fee for this service. Number nine, will other materials accompany the book? Have you created an instructor's manual or a student study guide? Is there an audio or computer program that will go along with the book? Number 10, are there specialized groups who might buy the book in quantity, for example, a book club that caters to counselors, therapists, or behavioral scientists? 
What about libraries and universities? If you have written a reference book, it could appeal to the library market. If you personally have any ideas for promoting the work, this is the place to share them. Number 11. Did you send your materials, including a sample chapter or two, to the publisher or agent using regular mail or delivery? The answer should always be yes. Do not send your package using fancy express delivery with signed receipt postcards and the like. Also, at this point in time, do not send your materials as an email attachment unless a publisher or a Always use number my 11 strategic guidelines as a final checklist to rate your proposal before it hits the mailbox or delivery service truck. Incidentally, some publishers will send your entire proposal package to two or three reviewers outside of the publishing house who have knowledge and experience in the topic area you are writing about. These book reviewers, who are often required to be published book authors themselves, will assist the editor in terms of making the decision, and they often receive a small sum of money for their work. I hope I've got you excited. Because if the editor for the publishing house likes your idea, you will receive a book contract. All right, now for a no-holds-barred question and answer session. Here are the questions I am asked most at workshops. Question, what is a SASE? One publisher's website stipulated that I must send this with my materials. Answer, S-A-S-E stands for Self-Addressed Stamped Envelope. It means that when you send your query letter and book proposal, chapters, and resume, you will include a self-addressed stamped envelope to return the materials to you if you are rejected. Top authors in the field do not engage in this practice, but new authors should comply with this policy. Question. Are you 100% sure that what you told us about multiple submissions is accurate? I'm not trying to act like a know-it-all, but two different professors in graduate classes I attended, ethics and research methods, were adamant about the fact that the practice of multiple submissions has been deemed unethical. Answer. Would you believe it if I told you that your professors are correct? But so am I. Multiple submissions to scientific referee journals are not permitted. But when you are writing a regular book, they are permitted. Onward. Question. You seem to be putting this question off forever and I can't wait a moment longer. Do I really need an agent? Answer. Does an agent really need you? For textbooks used in K-12 schools, colleges, and universities, the answer is an unequivocal no. In fact, the major publishers in this genre absolutely positively don't want you to have an agent. The same is generally true of academic publishers. If you were writing a book for therapists, agency counselors, private practitioners, caseworkers, etc., then you are writing an academic book and you don't want an agent. Okay, listen closely. Put your ear up to the speaker. This means that nearly everybody listening to this program does not need an agent. Have I made myself clear? On the other hand, if you have written a trade or mass market book that will sell primarily to a publisher that targets books to the general public, say your local bookstore, then yes, I highly recommend an agent. If you have the type of, say, self-improvement book that might show up at the checkout line at the grocery store or the book rack at the local pharmacy, then secure an agent. If you have a type of book that is featured on big talk shows, then yes, you generally need an agent because this market is very hard to crack 
and many trade publishers only take materials submitted by agents. In fact, some will refuse to read materials that are not submitted by agents. <laughs> One word of caution here, folks. Many agents forthrightly admit that they reject between 90 and 99% of all book ideas. The irony is that statistically, getting an agent can be as tough or tougher than getting a publisher to accept your work. In addition, agents work on a commission, and so they will be getting a piece of the action when you receive your royalties. Also, if an agent wants to charge you a big fee to read your proposal or manuscript, I want you to take your gas pedal, press it to the floor, kick it into passing gear, and take off like a scared rabbit. Legitimate agents do not charge for this service. Keep shopping, my friend. Question. I have a dynamite title for my book. Will the publisher change it? Answer. It is possible that the publisher will indeed change your title. The good news is that these folks are experts, and thus they are usually much better at picking winning titles than authors are, so don't sweat it. On several occasions, publishers came up with ideas that were clearly superior to my own. And here's a super hint. If you have a creative, catchy, but intriguing title that is not explicit, make sure that you create a subtitle that is explicit. For example, if I wrote a book titled Using Adlerian Therapy in Group Counseling, then the title tells the whole story. Everybody reading the title knows in a moment's notice basically what the book is about. I could use a subtitle, but it's not absolutely necessary. On the other hand, if I chose the title Molding the Mind, well, quite frankly, that could mean virtually anything under the sun. There's nothing wrong with a title like that. I don't have anything against an esoteric title, but you will need to use a subtitle, such as A Guide to Existential Therapy with Native Americans, just to be sure that the reader truly comprehends the precise nature of your book. Question. What are the chances that I will get rich off my monthly royalty checks? Answer. Zero. <laughs> Sorry to inform you, but publishers won't be sending you a monthly or weekly royalty check. Most publishers only pay royalties twice a year, and I work with one publisher who only paid once a year. Question. I just want to check my math here. If my book sells for $10 and my royalty is 10%, Will I really be making a crisp $1 bill every time a copy of my book is sold? Sorry to inform you, but no. You'll be making a lot less than a dollar. Now, I know that $1 seems to be the logical answer, but it's way too high. Here's why. First, some publishers don't pay you for the first 400 or so copies to help recoup their publishing costs. In other words, it is conceivable you won't get paid any royalties on the first few hundred books. Next, royalties are generally paid on what the bookstore or wholesale book distributor pays for the book. Therefore, the bookstore or online internet bookseller paid perhaps $6 or maybe $7.50 for your $10 book. Hence, you will get paid royalties on $6 or maybe $7.50. Check your book contract for specifics. Question. Since authors are paid via royalties, can an author ever get a raise after writing a book? Answer. Well, folks in a business probably wouldn't call it a raise, but in a sense it's similar. Many publishers Work on a royalty schedule so that the more books you sell, the higher your royalty percentage. Thus, just to hit you with a hypothetical example, the publisher might agree to give you 8% of net sales 
on the first 3,000 copies and then pump your royalties up to, say, 10% on 3,001 copies and beyond. Question, how is a book author different than a book editor? Answer, great question. I've been a book editor on several occasions and thus I feel mega qualified to answer this question. As an editor, you create the query letter proposal and the idea for your book, just what I've been talking about. You must sell the idea to a publisher or agent. As a book editor, nevertheless, you will not write the whole book. Here's an actual example. When I wrote my book, Favorite Counseling and Therapy Techniques, I wrote the introductory chapter and the closing or summary chapter. I also contributed my own personal favorite counseling technique. The rest of the techniques in my book were contributed by people like Albert Ellis, William Glasser, and Arnold Lazarus. If the contributors demand a fee, it would generally be up to you, not the publisher, to pay the contributors. Incidentally, it might have occurred to you that all the therapists I just mentioned as contributors are famous. And hey, it's great to have famous therapists as contributors. Nevertheless, I know a colleague who has written one of the best-selling paperback counseling books in history, and most of her contributors are not famous therapists. So it is not absolutely necessary to pack the pages with luminaries in the field. Your publisher will give you a release of information that each contributor must sign before the work goes to press. Essentially, the contributor has agreed that it's okay to print whatever he or she has written or said to you in an interview or in their contribution. Question. I've heard that there's an insider's secret that helps authors make more money than what is on their royalty checks. Are you willing to reveal this information? Answer. Why not? Published book authors can almost always buy a chunk of books for themselves to sell at workshops and seminars. Often the book contract will stipulate that the author can receive a quantity discount. That is to say, the more books you buy at once, the better the discount. Question. A lot of what you have shared seems negative. This business seems so rough and tumble. I demand to know the truth. Can you even give me one reason to be optimistic? I mean, do agents and publishing houses really want me to publish a book? Answer, no. They don't want you to publish a book. They want you to publish several books. When I published the aforementioned favorite counseling and therapy techniques, sales were healthy. The publisher was thus behind me 100% when I proposed a sequel, Favorite Counseling and Therapy Homework Assignments. So yes, agents and publishing houses want you to succeed. They are hot to trot for new book manuscripts. They are on your side. Why? Because they can only stay in business if you succeed. They want you to come up with a winner and then a winner after that, and another winner after that, and so on. Well, it's time to say goodbye so you can begin writing your query letter and book proposal. 